During the late Western Jin Dynasty, all of China was embroiled in war. The imperial court of Western Jin was forced to move south and make Jen Kung its new capital. This dynasty became known as the Eastern Jin. In North China, more than 10 ethnic minorities established short-lived sovereign states. China entered the period of the 16 kingdoms of the five barbarians. It would last more than 100 years. The 16 kingdoms period came to an end with the rise of the nomadic Xi'an Bei, who established what became known as Northern Wei in North China. It was the first long-lived sovereign state ever established in China by a non-Han ethnic group, the Toba clan of the Xi'an Bei. The Xi'an Bei were rough and ready nomads from the northern grasslands, whereas the Han Chinese belonged to a long-established agricultural civilization. Inevitably, there was a cultural collision between the two peoples, and painful adjustments had to be made. After more than a hundred years of political and cultural turmoil, the Xian Bei finally put down roots in North China. But this process of national integration was long and hard. Figurines of the Northern Way Ceremonial Guard. Clearly, it would be a long time before the grassland nomads could integrate into the Chinese culture. But to retain their position in the central plains, the Northern Way rulers had to find a way to consolidate their rule. What could they do to change things? The first step was to implement one nation, two systems. The Xian Bei and the Han each lived under their own social system. This innovative policy eased the tension between the Xian Bei and the Han and helped put the emerging dynasty on a firm footing. At the same time, the imperial court began recruiting Han officials. These officials began to govern jointly with Xi'an Bei nobles. The areas containing both Xi'an Bei and Han grew larger over time. During the first 50 years of Xi'an Bei rule, more than a million Han Chinese moved to Pingchang, leading to the integration of Han and non-Han customs and traditions.
这样的一个发展，中间有波折，有起落，应该是这样一个过程。啊，你一开始为什么非常尖锐？那你直接就把我们占领了，啊，人都有反侵略，对吧？反压迫，对吧？这种那当然是非常尖锐了。The rulers always had to strike a balance between ethnic interests and those of national unity. But after the death of Tuo Ba Gui, the balance tilted towards ethnic conflict. As conquerors, the Xi'an Bei were prone to looting and burning. It was not uncommon for them to plunder and oppress the Han Chinese. Looting was traditionally their main source of income. The growing ethnic conflict caused peasant uprisings. During the rule of the Northern Wei emperors, there were over 80 such revolts. The rulers had no choice but to try to turn this situation around. In 423 AD, the 17-year-old Tuo Ba Tao became the third emperor of Northern Wei. He had to address the conflict between his subjects. In the third year of his reign, Tuo Ba Tao had a magnificent building erected outside eastern Ping Chung. It was not for himself, nor yet for a favorite concubine. It was dedicated to the worship of a Han Chinese, the founder of Confucianism, Confucius. Tuo Bao Ta came here often to pay his respects. He also founded an imperial academy here for the sons of Xianbei and Han nobility to study Confucianism. He wanted to use Confucianism to unite his subjects and so bolster his power. In the Bei Wei Tongzi Jitian, there are some signs of corruption. The first one is that the Han Chinese have already admitted that the Bei Wei from the beginning 到武帝开国之际开始设立五经博士，设立太学，来进行教学，就已经确立了儒学在国家政治当中的地位。应该说这是没有问题。Confucianism was one thing, but the Northern Wei court also needed officials who understood Han Chinese culture. Tuo Bao Ta recruited a large number of Han scholars, once hundreds of them on a single occasion. Although Xian Bei nobles still hunted on horseback, agriculture was flourishing both on existing farmland and newly cultivated wasteland. The economy was booming. After implementing a range of signification policies, the Northern Wei dynasty appeared stable and increasingly strong. Northern Wei cavalry led by Tuo Ba Ta conquered first Northern Yan and then Northern Liang. This reunited North China, which had been plagued by fighting for over 120 years. However, the road to signification was not smooth. The Xian Bei nobles felt uneasy about signification. They also felt threatened by the rise of Han officials. The increasing conflicts between the nomadic and farming cultures led to a major crisis in ethnic relations. It was customary in China for specially appointed officials to compile a history of their own times. 
The Chuobao clan, who strongly identified with Chinese civilization, wanted to chronicle the progress of their dynasty in a fitting style. But they had no writing, and had so far relied on the spoken word. Thus, the Northern Wei ruler needed to appoint a Han scholar who knew Xianbei history and served in the court. Sui Ha, who came from the best-known Northern Chinese family and had served as an official under three Northern Wei rulers, was the best candidate for the job. In 439 AD, Sui Ha was entrusted with the task of compiling the Guo Shu, or History of the Northern Wei. Now, Chinese historians had long been expected to be frank in their writing. And after spending 10 years on collecting material, Sui Ha came up with a detailed history of the Tuoba clan. Tuoba Ta had asked Sui Ha to compile an accurate history. But many Xianbei officials were far from happy with what Sui brought to light about the early days of the dynasty. Beiwei The Xianbei nobility had no time for Sui's frankness. They viewed his history as a blatant provocation on the part of the Han and a humiliation of the Xianbei leadership. They called for the death of Sui Hao and his followers. One day in July of the year 450, they visited retribution on Sui Hao for revealing the misdeeds of the Shen Bei ancestors and so shaming the Tuoba clan. Sui Hao, his entire family, and the prominent families with marital connections to Sui were all executed. Altogether, more than 300 people were put to death in what was termed the execution of the official who wrote the history of Northern Wei and his extended family. The turmoil wiped out almost all the prominent Han families in North China. Tuobao Tao had intended the Guo Shu to boost the prestige of his dynasty. Instead, the outrage of the Xianbei nobility forced him to execute four prominent Han families which only intensified the conflict between the Shenbei and the Han. Zhuang是确实存在的差异 what future did the Xianbei have in North China if they lost the support of the Han? Zhuobao Tao was now like a lonely eagle hovering in the sky, trying to find his way. Why had his aunt
remnants of the Shinbei's early days. Da Jun and his family rely on the forest for a living. Every day he goes into it and peels bark from the birch trees. The family's main source of income is the sale of handcrafted products made from the bark. His daughter processes the pieces he collects. But to make do, the family needs additional income. Darjun's wife sews animals' skins and furs to make clothing, but these are from elsewhere. With the number of local animals falling, hunting is now forbidden in their region. Darjun's way of life has been changing dramatically for more than a decade. Thousands of years ago, the Shenbei who lived here faced a similar situation. In 200 BC, the Twoba clan was living in the greater Kingkan Mountains. They lived by hunting. With the human population on the rise, wildlife numbers plummeted. Winter lasted seven months, and for most of that time, the region was covered in snow. The Xianbei had to decide whether they should stay or leave. The Xianbei leader of the time led his people out of the mountains. It was a long journey filled with hardship and danger. They crossed snowy mountains and forests. After traveling hundreds of kilometers, they reached Hulan Lake in present-day Inner Mongolia. There, on the grassland, they began a new life as nomads. The water and grassland were plentiful, but for the Xi'an Bay, it was a stopover, not the destination. They wanted to move into the wealthy central plains of northern China. While the Xianbei were living on the eastern steppe, they came under threat from former Qin, whose rulers aimed to expand their territory and unify northern China. But a great opportunity was about to present itself. In 383, former Qin, which controlled northern China, was defeated in the Battle of Fei River. The former Qin regime collapsed. The Toba clan of the Xi'an Bay filled the vacuum by occupying northern China. They had reached their desired destination, but now they faced a new challenge. How to live in their new home? Toba Tao was northern Wei's third emperor. He was the ruler of the empire and the leader of the Torbar clan. It was his responsibility to ensure that his people settled successfully in northern China. With the conflict between Xian Bei and Han intensifying after the execution of Cui Hao, Torbar Tao's life also came to an end. He was assassinated by a eunuch during a power struggle at court. How could the Xianbei assimilate into Chinese culture? Tuo remembered as Emperor Tai Wu of Northern Wei, had not found the answer. Perhaps succeeding emperors might. In the following 20 years, Northern Wei was in political turmoil. The dynasty reached the verge of collapse. Tung. 
各方面的矛盾呀，反而就更加尖锐了，更加尖锐了。你比如说，很多的这个，我就是汉族大臣呀，就是因为没实行这个俸禄制嘛，又得不到赏赐。赏赐只有军立军功才能得到赏赐，所以生活是很拮据。Today is a special date for peasants living in Datung and its surrounding areas. On this special date, the local women make yellow rice cakes. It's a special day because it's the first day of the spring farming season. More than 1,500 years ago, a child accompanied by Northern Way officials entered a rice paddy on the first day of the spring farming season. The child was Tobai Hung, Emperor Shaowun of Northern Way. He was the dynasty's sixth emperor. The well-groomed middle-aged woman standing beside him was his grandmother, Grand Empress Dowager Feng. Since the Qin and Han dynasties, emperors accompanied by their officials had personally planted a rice seedling in a paddy field at springtime. The ritual symbolized the importance they placed on agriculture and arable land. Now the members of the Northern Wei imperial family were entering the paddy field once again. Song Tai Hou 呢是名义上是孝文帝的祖母，呃，但是实际上不是亲生的，因为北魏有这个子贵母死的制度，所以呃，孝文帝的亲生的祖母和母亲呢都，呃，很早就死去了。那么冯太后呢，实际上是个汉人，呃，那么她呃从小呢就给对孝文帝呢就是很注意，对他呃用汉族的文化来熏陶影响。were improved. The official's salary was ultimately funded by contributions from peasants who were themselves supported by the land. After the foundation of the Northern Wei dynasty, many ethnic minorities from the frontiers of northern China flooded into the central plains, generating a large number of refugees. The flow of refugees became the major cause of social instability and was a break on economic development. In 485 AD, Emperor Shaowen promulgated a new land law entitled Equal Distribution of Farmlands. 
Under this law, the government distributed all unoccupied land to farmers based on the labor and cattle each farmer had available. Chinese 呃，逐渐改变自己的生产方式，从游牧变成农耕。那么，这个军权制在这几方面呢，其实都发挥了非常重要的作用。Farmers with an income from the land had to pay tax. To ensure compliance from the agricultural population, the emperor appointed officials to oversee three levels of rural production, with five families constituting a neighborhood. Five neighborhoods a hamlet, and five hamlets a commune. As an incentive for farmers, the emperor also introduced a new Su Jiao tax system. The more land a farmer could cultivate, the lower the tax he had to pay. In the course of their hundred year reign in northern China, the Tuoba Xianbei had finally learnt that the key to a successful and long-lasting reign was the fertile soil at their feet. These workers are constructing a replica of Northern Wei's Ming Tang, or Bright Hall. The original hall was built at the time of the Taihe reforms. It was the place where Emperor Shaowen met officials and participated in the rituals of ancestor worship. The Bright Hall was also the place where ancient emperors made declarations aimed at educating the public. The existence of a Northern Way Bright Hall shows how thoroughly Chinese the political and economic system had become under the Taihe reforms. Life was peaceful and abundant. The rulers of Northern Wei made every effort to accord with Chinese notions of governance. After six years of reforms, Northern Wei reached its height during the Taihe period of prosperity, as it is known. Meanwhile, Emperor Shaowen had grown up under the tutelage of Grand Empress Dowager Feng. In 490 AD, Grand Empress Dowager Feng passed away, and Emperor Shaowen began to reign in his own right at the age of 24. Brave and adventurous, Emperor Shaowen was also fascinated by Chinese culture. He implemented a drastic policy of signification. After Grand Empress Dowager Feng's death, he observed a three-year period of filial mourning for her. This was unprecedented for Xian Bei, and not at all in accordance with Xian Bei funeral customs. The Emperor's mourning plans met with furious opposition from the Shenbei nobles. They would not countenance such a deviation from tradition. Han Chinese officials dared not speak up in support of Emperor Xiaowen. They remembered the fate of Sui Hao and had no wish to be executed in another conflict between Shenbei and Han. 当时小文帝有很大的压力
，但是呢，这这个表面上呢，又提出了很多的理由，不行的理由。实际上，他们说的这些理由都是这些托阿贵族说的理由。最后被孝文帝一一驳倒。Although the Shenbei rulers had adopted a Chinese-style political system, there were still huge cultural differences between the Shenbei and the Han. The Shenbei had to decide whether to maintain their own customs and traditions, or learn to embrace a more advanced culture and begin a new way of life. The decision lay with the Northern Wei rulers. Emperor Shaowen had received a Confucian education. He was looking for ways to immerse his people in Han culture and conform with Han traditions. Emperor Shaowen awarded Confucius the title of Father Ni, Sage of Letters. After Grand Empress Dowager Feng passed away, he built a temple to Confucius. This too was unprecedented in Northern Wei, but powerful nobles in Pinchang still resisted Emperor Shaowen's signification policies. How could he persuade the Shenbei that they should assimilate into Chinese culture? Once the mourning period for the Empress Dowager was over, Emperor Shaowen decided to attack the states of southern China and unify the nation. His decision puzzled both the Shenmei nobles and his Han officials. He also departed from his usual methods of consultation. He wouldn't discuss his decision. He was simply determined to implement it. In September 493 AD, Emperor Shaowen led an army of 300,000 men southward. He asked his imperial officials to march south along with it. It was the rainy season. The march on muddy roads in pouring rain was long and difficult. When they reached Luoyang, everyone was exhausted. Tatishada 迁到了洛阳，洛阳我们称为叫天下之中，中州之地。In 494, Emperor Shaowen officially changed the capital to Luoyang. The Shenbei had made Pingcheng their first capital. A hundred years later, they settled in Luoyang, the heartland of northern China. Luoyang was a stronghold of Han culture. By moving there, Emperor Shaowen intended to distance himself from his conservative Xianbei officials. The relocation of the capital laid the groundwork for him to enforce his policies of signification. Soon, a Han-style imperial wedding was held in the palace at Luoyang. Emperor Shaowen married Lady Wu, who was from a Han Chinese family in northern China. After the relocation of the capital, Emperor Shaowen married women from a number of prominent Han families. Then he started his reforms.
while promulgating marriage regulations, he made Chinese the official language and banned officials under the age of 30 from speaking in the Shenbei language. Also, the imperial family had to learn Chinese and speak it from then on. There were many nunneries in Luoyang. One of them was the Yao Guang nunnery. Two years after the relocation of the capital, Empress Consort Feng was deposed and sent there to become a nun. Her offense was that she had insisted on speaking the Shenbei language in the palace in an open challenge to the emperor's ban. He responded by banishing her to the nunnery, where she spent the rest of her life. Shortly before this, the emperor wearing traditional Chinese imperial clothing had presented his imperial officials with Han-style uniforms. After that, they were not allowed to wear Shenbei clothes in public. The Shenbei nobles took Han surnames to replace their own surnames. Between them, they adopted over a hundred new Han names. The emperor changed his surname from Toba to Yuan, so that his name became Yuan Hung. One year after the relocation of the capital, Xiao Wun and his officials went to present-day Chu Fu in Shandong province to offer a sacrifice in the Confucius temple. He was, of course, a fervent admirer of Confucius. But he also wanted to announce to the world that Confucian doctrine was to be the empire's guiding ideology. Emperor Shaowen even changed household registrations to say that the Xianbei were native to the Woyang. This meant that when a Xianbei died, he had to be buried in Luoyang and not in Pingchang. For his own mausoleum, the emperor chose Mount Meng, which was close to Luoyang. He named the site the Chang Mausoleum. Xiao Wen, the Northern Wei emperors who succeeded him, and the Shenbei officials who had relocated to Luoyang were all buried there. From the Today, countless villages are scattered around Emperor Shaowen's mausoleum. The other ancient tombs have all vanished away, and it is impossible to tell whether the villages are Han or Xianbei. On the surface, Emperor Shaowen's reforms angered his own people by forcing them to abandon their own customs and traditions and conform with those of the Han Chinese. 
But as a tribal leader, he fulfilled the will of his ancestors by fully integrating the entire Tuobar clan into the Chinese civilization. Under his leadership, many other ethnic groups were brought together in this great national integration. It is precisely because of this integration that the development of the Chinese nation runs unceasingly like a great river torrent.